Stephanie Grillo. And I am Tiffany Cole, and this is Coming, Coming in, in Hot. Hot. Coming in Hot is a cold reading series where a collection of individuals such as yourself come together to hear sample pages of new works from New Mexico's screenwriters and playwrights. And this is a space for these writers to hear their work out loud. No direction, just a bunch of ruffian actors doing their thing. Um, now, what's going to happen tonight? I, I actually don't know because this is a bit of a live show, so pretty much anything can happen. But we do have a little bit of a rundown for you. Hopefully these things will happen. So <laughs> we have three writers, three scripts, six actors, and one amazing, glorious reader of actions. Uh, we are not here to listen to the script that won the festival uh, that has been in several pitch you know, sessions or yep. anything like that. We are here to listen to the very early stages of development of New Mexico writers' scripts. Um, so this is basically the workshop experience without a talk back afterwards. So there's no feedback, <laughs> no talk back. Those were the writers. If you would love to shower the writer with your um, undying love mm -hmm. and affections, please do it like a normal person at the bar or in the parking lot or whatever. You know, creep style. <laughs> um, and just to let you know who we are here at Coming In Hot, we promote the development of new works that are in progress from all sorts of New Mexican writers, screenwriters, and playwrights. This is a shared space for professional film professionals, theater professionals to work on their craft. This is also a space for diversity, equity, and equality, not just for the writers that are in this program, but for everyone involved. Uh, now, before we get the show on the road, let's go ahead and introduce our amazing, talented group of actors. Uh, let's go ahead and give them a round of applause. Woo! First up, we have Marcus Ivy, Jeanette Aguilar Harris, Janelle Baptiste, Robin Casper, C. Fields Haley, and Noe Field Park Perkins. Amazing. And now we also have with us our amazingly talented, multi-talented reader of action, Matthew McDuffie. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, tonight's show, I just want to say tonight's show cannot be possible without our generous supporters. Um, and first of all, our friends here at the West, which is the space to start and grow your business and Triple Tone Post Audio. Thank you all so much for supporting us. We really appreciate you. And without further ado, let's start the show. So our first piece this evening is Good Friday by Tatiana Isabel Gill. Tatiana Isabel Gill is a writer and theater artist based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Her passions include new play development, art as activism, and ice lattes. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> Recently, she had her first short film, El Vestido de Valle, featured in the Cherry Reel Festival at the University of New Mexico. Currently, she is working with Santa Fe Playhouse as a commissioned playwright for their production, The Melodrama. When Tati is not creating art, she is a producer and co-facilitator for a new theater artist collective centering QT BIPOC artist called The New World's Incubator. Without further ado, let's bring Tati Anna up here to talk about her piece tonight. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Tatiana or Tati, and I am the writer of Good Friday. And let's see, I'll keep it short. Uh, Good Friday is what happens when you are devoutly Catholic and deeply queer at the same exact time. <laughs> 
and you really got to wrestle with that and see how uh, you decide to move forward when you're in love with, you know, somebody you're not supposed to be in love with, so the religion says. So, enjoy. Good Friday by Tatiana Isabel Gill. And we begin. Exterior, Rhode Island, seaside, day. The ocean waves hit the rocks as rain falls. Then the cloister of the Sacred Heart campus emerges into view. The campus sprawls across the skyline, an old castle ground. Interior, chapel, day. The sound of rain murmurs its way into the chapel, which is lined with stained glass windows depicting the stations of the cross. Lights low, 20 habited nuns sit in wooden pews, while Father John, 55, a tall, dark, and sharp-eyed priest, preaches his homily. His words are unclear and far away. Sister Mary Catherine, 21, a tomboyish, red-headed novice with freckles and a shy smile, and Sister Eugenia, 21, a beautiful, bright-eyed, Afro-Latina novice, sit next to each other trying not to giggle. They catch each other's eyes with sly side glances. Mother Superior, 45, a bitter, blue-eyed tyrant, flashes them a stern look. <laughs> Sister Mary Catherine and Sister Eugenia quickly become serious and pay attention to Father John, who is now in focus. Tonight at midnight, the agony in the garden commences Jesus' long and painful journey to his death on the cross. We, we must walk with him in hours of suffering so that he is not alone, for he did die to save us. Sisters? How are we contemplating Jesus' suffering and death this season? What can you give up to stand in solidarity with his suffering? All the nuns bow their heads and write in their little notebooks. Sister Mary Catherine writes in her notebook, want to be Eucharistic adoration buddies? <laughs> Sister Eugenia sees the note and responds in her notebook, already signed us up for 2 a.m. Sister Mary Catherine sees this. They share a smile that two lovers would share. The 20 habited nuns file out from the chapel, two by two, as the organ plays. As Sister Mary Catherine and Eugenia are about to exit the chapel, Mother Superior stops them. <clears throat> Ladies, being filled with the joy of Christ is a gift, but I sense there may be other things going on. It is Holy Week, and our Christ is on his journey to death. Please, behave accordingly. Yes, Mother. Yes, Mother. The girls bow their heads and walk out of the chapel. Just as they walk out, they start giggling. The clock <laughs> strikes 8 p.m. Into your sister Eugenia's bedchamber night, Sister Eugenia lies on top of her simple twin-size bed in full habit. The light of the moon spills in through her one window. The cru crucifix and the framed photos of her family on her wall stare at her, her eyes eagerly on the clock. She wills time to move faster. The clock ticks. The clock moves from 1 a.m. to 1.01 a.m. Kneeling on her individual kneeler, she starts praying the rosary silently. Her eyes linger to the clock as she does so, then dart back to focus on the beads of the rosary. Interior, Sister Mary Catherine's bedchamber night. Sister Mary Catherine is under the covers of her simple twin-size bed. The light of the moon spills in through her one window. The crucifix and framed pictures of her family stare at her. She anxiously looks at the clock. The clock ticks. The clock moves from 1.30 a.m. to 1.31 a.m. <laughs> Suddenly, she flings off the covers, exposing her basketball shorts and oversized t-shirt of a pajama. She looks at the clock and paces. She stares at her habit laid out over her individual kneeler, interior hallway night. The hallway is still. The light of the moon spilling through the windows. The candle-lit hallway lights flicker. The moonlight finds the hallway's clock. At the end of the hall, a hand holding a candle is seen opening the chapel door. Suddenly, the clock strikes 2 a.m. Insert Mary Catherine's bedchamber night. Sister Mary Catherine gasps. Interior, insert Sister Eugenia's bedchamber night. An excited smile spreads across Sister Eugenia's face. Finally. Interior hallway, moments later. 
Sister Eugenia races down the hallway, moonlight illuminating her face, the image of a floating angel. She glides quickly to the chapel door at the end of the hallway, hands shaking. She reaches for the chapel door. Interior chapel night, Sister Eugenia's eyebrows furrow while her lips pierce tightly. The chapel is low lit by the light of the moon and candles, one focused light illuminating the beautiful gold monstrous, mon monstrous placed in the middle of the bare altar. The kneeler made for two at the foot of the monstrance is empty. Sister Eugenia watches, watch reads 2.10 a.m. Interior bedroom corridor, continuous night. Sister Eugenia quickly makes her way down the bedroom corridor, lined with bedroom doors on both sides. She stops at door, so what is that, eight, and lightly knocks. Sister Mary Catherine, now habited, cracks the door open slowly. Hola. Are you okay? Sister Eugenia's eyes glitter, meeting Sister Mary Catherine's shy gaze. Yes. Sorry, I was feeling sick. I was just gonna come down. Sick? Oh no. Oh yes, vomit everywhere. <laughs> you have to be glad I didn't let you in on it. You're joking. Sister Eugenia tries not to smile. It wasn't that bad. Yes, I'm joking. Well, come on then, Christ is waiting all alone. Interior hallway, moments later, Sister Eugenia and Mary Catherine float quickly down the hall toward the chapel door, moonlight catching their feet, the folds of their habits and their faces. The two place their hands on the doorknob to the chapel at the same time, Mary Catherine landing on top. The two share a nervous, excited look. Interior chapel, continuous night. Sister Eugenia and C Mary Catherine kneel at the foot of the monstrance, Shoulder to shoulder, all is silent except for the sound of the novices breathing and their hearts racing. They kneel still as statues. Sister Mary Catherine closes her eyes, insert flashes of a hazy series of imagined moments. Sister Eugenia, habited, flashes a disarming smile. Sister Eugenia, unha unhabited, with natural hair, moving her hips to music. Sister Eugenia, in a bra, tilting her head back, moaning with pleasure. Back! Sister Mary Catherine's eyes snap open. Sister Mary Catherine takes out her rosary and forces herself to slow her breathing. Sister Eugenia sneaks a side glance at Sister Mary Catherine. Sister Eugenia wipes her sweaty hands on her habit. Sister Eugenia closes her eyes, insert flashes of a hazy series of imagined moments. Sister Mary Catherine habited smiles while sticking her tongue out. Sister Mary Catherine, uninhab unhabited, winks while moving a basket ba ball between her strong hands. Sister Mary Catherine in a white ribbed tank, biting her lip and moaning in pleasure. Back! Sister Eugenia's eyes snap open. Sister Eugenia bows her head and squeezes her hands into a prayer to stop them from shaking. The two shift slightly on the kneeler multiple times. Finally, they are able to maintain completely still. Interior hallway night, Eugenia playfully bumps Mary Catherine as they slowly walk down the hallway. You left your book in my room? Do you want to come grab it before we part ways? Yes. They dilly-dally down the hall. Their <laughs> fingers touch. So sorry. No need to apologize. You know, I am so thirsty. <laughs> Should we stop by the kitchen to get water? Interior convent night, kitchen night. An ancient castle kitchen remodeled with technology of the 1990s emerges as the novices scurry to the fridge. Moonlight pours in through the windows. Sister Mary Catherine opens the fridge door. The moonlight falls across Mary Catherine's back, making her glow against the window like an angel. Sister Eugenia stares in awe, but quickly fixes her face when Sister Mary Catherine turns around. Sister Mary Catherine closes the fridge. Cups are filled with water. Hands grab cups. They drink their water while being washed over by the light of the moon. Mary Catherine's face glistens in all its freckly glory. Eugenia stares. Your freckles. What about them? Oh, just that, that the moonlight, you, you can see them in this light. Just then, Mother Superior appears at the entrance of the kitchen. Ladies, what are you doing up and about? You should be in bed. I was feeling ill after adoration and we just came to get some water. We were just about to go back to our rooms. Sister Eugenia quickly washes, dries, and puts away the two water cups. Yes, we were just leaving. Adoration was so moving. I hope you get some rest, Mother. The girls quickly scoot out of the kitchen. Mother Superior looks at them with suspicion. Sister Mary Catherine's bedchamber, minutes later. Oh, gosh, I, I wonder where I put it. Sister Mary Catherine's hand moves a pillow on her bed to reveal Sister Eugenia's book. Sister Mary Catherine blushes deeply. 
You sleep with my book under your pillow. That's very sweet. Reading my book before you head off to sleep. Yeah, it's sort of like saying goodnight to you. Oh, then maybe you should keep it. Or I should give you something, I don't know, more um, suitable for a good night from me. A handkerchief, perhaps? No. <laughs> no, I, I don't even own one of those, silly, and neither do you. What is this, the 1800s? <laughs> Might as well be in this old castle. That's true. <clears throat> Maybe I'll give you my broken beeper. It's conveniently stuck on the words, I love you, so... Maybe that would work. I love you? Yeah. Why would that work? Because it's special and you're special. Oh. Shaking hands, deep breathing, both steal shy glances at each other between burning cheeks. They slowly calm down. What, what's going on? We're best friends. I know you better than anyone, I think. You can trust me, no matter what it is. It's you or us? I don't know. Me? Sister Mary Catherine is up now, pacing. Yes, you. I'm the problem? Like, I just want to be with you all the time and be super close to you and alone with you and hold you and be held by you. like. I miss you all the time, even though we see each other every day. And I don't know, ever since we came here, it just sort of magnified. I see. Can you come back next to me, please? Is that a trick question? Come on, Kat, it's just me. Sister Mary Catherine joins her on the bed. I have been feeling the same, I just, I never want to be away from you. But maybe I gave it away with the beeper. So dumb. Not dumb. <laughs> Are we going to hell? <laughs> I'm not sure. I didn't ever think these kinds of feelings would feel so safe. So, I don't know. <laughs> I make you feel safe? Yeah. Yeah, you do. I feel that too. And confused, very, very confused. Tense silence. They find each other's hands and hold them, fingers laced. You're sweet. Like pie. Like <laughs> cotton candy hurt my teeth. <laughs> oh no, how could I? <laughs> I guess you can't help yourself. They fall into a sweet kiss edged with hunger. They slowly pull away, just enough to meet eyes. The words barely escape their lips. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Sister Mary Catherine goes in for another kiss, but Sister Eugenia stops her. Can you, can you hold me? I would love nothing more. Hold each other and nothing more. And nothing more. The nuns semi-awkwardly get into a comfortable cuddling position on Sister Mary Catherine's twin bed. The moonlight hits their faces as they settle into sleep. Exterior outdoor courtyard, sunrise. Sign of budding life in the garden, parts of the courtyard. Soft sunlight washes over the convent hallway in contrast to the dimly lit bedchamber corridor. Suddenly, a slit of light beams out through Sister Mary Catherine's door, and Sister Eugenia's hand is on the doorknob. See you later, alligator. Sister Mary Catherine's soft, sleepy smile catches in the sunlight as she leans on the doorframe. In a while, crocodile. The door opens, and Sister Eugenia emerges. The glow of the sun rise, illuminating her, starting her feet first. The door closes as she's mortal again, and she leans against the wall as Sister Mary Catherine leans against the same wall, but in her bedchamber. Across their faces run delight, the shadows of guilt, and then finally, dire confusion. Simultaneously, they clutch the cross on their necklaces, and we end. Give it up one more.
more time for Tatiana's Feast of Friday. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Olive Tree Compounding Pharmacy is a special place where I make medications from scratch to promote health, wellness, and the joy of life. Compounding is the art of pharmacy that allows me to be creative and innovative to make personalized solutions for your well-being. There are so many solutions that can be created outside of conventional medicine, and I enjoy helping to pinpoint the cause of specific symptoms to then design a formula that is customized to your health needs. After coming to Olive Tree Compounding Pharmacy, clients feel restored and revitalized. I am Dr. Ndidiamaka Obareke, and I take so much pride in serving you with my pharmacy knowledge and expertise. Visit us today. Bougiana Budget Bridal is Albuquerque's premier bridal boutique, offering budget-conscious brides a VIP experience like no other. All gowns in stock are $1,000 and below. We offer everything from off-rack designer samples to custom-made, one-of-a-kind gowns. Enjoy your private two-hour consultation, allowing you to be the center of attention that you should be. Book your private consultation today. West's mission is to be a home to entrepreneurs. We create a thriving, equitable economy by cultivating entrepreneurship and empowering underserved communities. In particular, women, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, low wealth New Mexicans, and those experiencing systemic barriers. We offer business training, one-on-one -on -one consulting, incubation, and access to capital. At West, we believe once a West client, always a West client. We're deeply committed to meeting the ever-changing needs of the small businesses we serve. Entrepreneurs face numerous challenges in today's fast-paced business world. West is dedicated to providing the highest level of support to help our clients overcome these obstacles and thrive. We believe in fostering a culture of continuous learning and growth within our organization and among the entrepreneurs we serve. By staying a step ahead, we support the evolving needs of small businesses and proactively develop new innovative programs and services. And we're back, folks. If you're just joining us, we are coming, coming in hot. <laughs> um, coming in hot is a space for writers to hear their work out loud with no direction, just a bunch of, I don't know, really wonderful actors and pretty dope live studio audience. It's true. <laughs> so, next up, we're gonna bring our next writer, Jeff Young, to the stage. But first, I would love to tell you a little bit about this writer. So, uh, Jeff is originally from North Dakota. Jeff has been immersed in the theater, film, and television scene since his arrival in Albuquerque in late 2021. Most recently, you have seen his performance as the male Greek chorus in How I Learned to Drive at the Vortex Theater, or as Doug in Gruesome Playground Injuries with Actors Studio 66. Jeff hopes to be able to produce, direct, and act in one of his original works very soon. So let's go ahead and bring our writer, Jeff, up to the stage. Hello. Thank you. Um, this piece was inspired by a coworker that had told me a story when he was a, a vagabond just out and about, and he rented a basement apartment from a very strange couple. So as you will see, this next piece, the couple upstairs is based off of that. The Couple Upstairs by Jeff Young. Interior car day. Jordan is in his car, dressed in a waiter's uniform, counting cash. Jordan's phone chimes. He picks it up. The text reads, have place to stay. Call me. 
Jordan dials the phone. Interior, intercut. Jordan's car, Matt's car, day. Hey, bitch. So you found somewhere. Yeah, I'm there now. I found a flyer at the grocery store. It's a pretty decent place, man. How much? Um, I don't know. I called the dude and he just told me to come over. Want me to wait for you? Uh, no, not right now. I'm, I'm heading. I can't come right now. What's the address? It's the corner of 9th Street and 4th Avenue. Got it. Okay. Just give me a few. I'll be over there. Exterior alleyway day. Jordan pulls into the alleyway, gets out, walks over to a guy. They shake hands and talk for a moment, and then Jordan leaves. Exterior house day. Jordan pulls up behind Matt's car. He gets out and looks over at the house. All right, not bad. He walks up the stairs to the front porch. He rings the doorbell. There's something banging and scattering. The door opens up to reveal Margot, mid-40s, looks a lot older, very unappealing, dressed in casual wear. Hello? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, my friend Matt said that he was here talking to you about your basement place. Oh, yes. You must be Jacob, was it? Jordan. Right. Well, your little friend, uh, he left already. But his car is right there. Oh, that's right. Dead. Uh, excuse me? He's dead. What? Jordan looks horrified. Oh, uh, my dear. The car. The car is dead. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh. Yeah, can, can I? Oh, yes, of course. Interior, the house, day. Jordan tries to adjust his eyes to the darkness. Right this way, dear. Would you like some water, soda, beer? You're old enough, yeah? Oh, definitely. I'm, I'm okay, though. Thank you. Suit yourself. She grabs a beer and cracks it open. Interior living room, upstairs, day. Margot leads Jordan into the room. He sits down on the couch. She sits across from him on the ottoman. So, you want the downstairs, do you? I mean, kinda, yeah, that would be... He notices Matt's backpack with his name embroidered in it, laying on the sofa next to him. Where did you say Matt went? Oh, uh, he was gonna call someone to come get him. Well, what did you guys talk about? Price, anything like that? $300. That, that's it? Yep. Only thing is we share a washer and dryer. Hope that won't be a bother. I can show you around down there if you'd like. Sure, that would be great. Interior, basement, day. Margot leads Jordan down the stairs. You have your own entrance and everything right here. Laundry mixed up in with the kitchen. Sorry. No, honestly, it's fine. I, I work at a restaurant, so I, I hardly ever use it. Oh, well, then great. There's a fridge in there, too. Some storage space, what have you. Great. Why so cheap? Well, there's really only one bedroom. Oh. Yeah, but, you know, it, it's all furnished and ready to move in. Will that be a problem? No, no, I, get, I guess we'll make it work, yeah. Perfect. Here's the bedroom. She opens the door. Bathroom's down the hall, and uh, whatever you do, please do not open the door next to the bathroom. Okay. Please. Yeah, sure. No problem. Let me... Call Matt. He was okay with everything? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. He said everything looked good. Cool. Jordan realizes how hot he is and that he's dripping sweat. Could I, uh, maybe get some of that water you offered before? Sure. She goes into the laundry room kitchen and comes out with a glass of water. Thanks. He chugs it. I'm just gonna... He motions with his phone towards the exit door. Oh, yes, of course. Let me show you. Exterior, front of the house, driveway, day. She leads him out to the driveway. So, that's how you get out. I'll leave you to your phone call. Just come up the front stairs if you don't mind. Sure. Margot goes back inside and closes the door with a bang. Jordan dials Matt. It rings and rings and rings. No answer. What the fuck, man? He dials again. It rings and rings. No answer. He goes to his car and grabs a duffel bag. Okay. Look, man, I'm, I'm just gonna take this offer. Let me know when you get back. I, I can help you jump your car or whatever. He goes back up the stairs and knocks on the door. Margot lets him back in, interior living room, upstairs, day. Well, I'm assuming this means you're staying? Yes, I need my own space. Thanks, here. He hands over 900 bucks. That should uh, cover the first and last in security deposit, yeah? Wow, yeah. Thank you so much. I think this will work out just fine. 
Great. I'm going to... Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Thanks. See ya. He turns around and then turns right back around. Uh, your husband. Is your husband around? I'd like to meet him. Uh, no. Um, he went with your little friend to help him. I thought you said... Yeah, well, I'll make sure to let him know you'll all be staying here, okay? Sure, thanks. He heads down the stairs. Into your bathroom, evening. Jordan gets ready to take a shower. He pulls a baggie out of his pocket. He dips his pinky in and rubs it on his gums. Bang! Jordan jumps and dumps the bag in the toilet. Fuck! No, 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 no. He tries to save it but fails. More bangs and crashes. Then a hard door slam! What the fuck is going on? He opens the door and is greeted by Frank, mid-fifties, dressed in dirty overalls. Fuck! Who are you? Uh, Jor Jordan. Ah, uh, new guy. Okay. Welcome. Don't go in this room. Got it? Yes, sir. Good. Frank turns to leave. <laughs> Wait, what about Matt? Ah, uh, the little fidgety kid, huh? Yeah, he says something about getting his car back to somewhere. I, I forgot. Oh, so he left. Yeah. Frank leaves. Jordan closes the door. Interior bedroom evening. Jordan tries Matt's phone again. He hears a chime upstairs. It, Im it is immediately cut off. Interior living room downstairs evening. Jordan stands at the bottom of the stairs. Hey, um, hello? Matt? He walks up a few stairs, tries the phone again. Nothing. Hey, um, Mr. <sighs> Fuck, I don't even know their last name. Hello? Interior kitchen upstairs, evening. Jordan reaches the top of the stairs. Thud! A noise from the living room. Jordan looks through the big glass window, looking into the living room. He watches in horror as Matt gets tied up and taken out of the sliding glass door. He watches out the windows as Frank drags Matt through the backyard. He rushes down the stairs and out the basement entrance. Exterior outside of the house, evening. He runs around the block to see Frank tossing Matt in the back of his pickup. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, you better stay right there, boy. Uh, what are you doing to him? Just never mind that. Go inside now. Jordan runs toward Frank and the pickup. Frank draws a gun. I said get back inside. Got it? Jordan backs off and watches as Frank drives away. Interior kitchen upstairs, evening. Jordan runs back in. Margo is waiting there. Mm. Such a <laughs> handsome boy. <laughs> Too bad your friend didn't want to play. Lady, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Come here. She lunges at him with a rope. Come here. He dodges her and runs back down the stairs. Interior downstairs, evening. Jordan runs. He goes to his room and starts packing his things. He hears Margo stomping down the stairs. He runs down the hall and into the room next to the bathroom. Interior downstairs, forbidden room, night. He starts to back away from the door and trips over something. He takes his phone out and turns on the flashlight. There's a man chained in the corner. He turns on the flashlight to reveal a bed. Sid, obese, age unknown, wearing a ratty white tank top, his bottom half covered mostly with a stomach, sits on on the bed. I love the live ones. Jordan scrambles to his feet. The man in the corner stirs awake. He jumps to his feet. Help, please, help me. What the fuck? Jordan opens the door and there stands Margo with a kitchen knife. He slams his palm right into Margo's face. She tumbles back into the bathroom. Jordan runs past her as the man continues to scream out for help. Help me. Exterior, front of the house, night. Jordan runs out of the house. He digs on his pockets for his keys. He unlocks his car and gets in, just as Frank pulls back up with his pickup truck. Frank jumps out and pulls his gun and aims it at Jordan. Jordan starts the car and speeds away. Frank trips off the curb and fires a shot into the air. He falls to the ground and the gun goes flying across the street. Interior Jordan's car, night. Jordan keeps checking the rear view mirror to make sure Frank isn't following him. He settles into his seat as he rounds the corner. He starts to laugh, then cry. He turns on a dark gravel road. Suddenly there stands Matt. Jordan hits the brakes and Matt, bloodied and torn up, gets in. Untie me, please. Yeah, uh, hold on. He searches for something to cut the tape with. He finally finds a long silver, silver pair of scissors. He cuts the tape. Thank you. What the fuck is going on? I don't know, man. I, his gun jammed when he tried to shoot me. He tried to sh shoot me. Oh my God. Oh, I, you know, at first I thought they were pretty cool, you know, like she was super nice. And then everything in, in the basement and then the smell. Fuck, could you not, sm the, not smell that? Like when you took, she took you down there, like rotting meat, like pus, Ew. an infected wound that wouldn't quite heal. Just that and uh, that thing on the bed. What is that, man? Like, is that, who was that? <laughs> we've seen some shit, you know, Jordy. We've seen some shit. I've, I've never seen anything like that before in my life, man. I guess I never expected I was, I was going to have 
seen anything like that in my life. Did he... That old man? He's fucking crazy, man. There's something wrong, wrong with the stairs. He... Did he make you play the game? What? The game, man! The fucking... <clears throat> fucking game! I, I didn't want to play, Frank. He can't get it up anymore. <laughs> so... So they, they rent the basement <clears throat> out to... They place fake ads all over the socials to... I don't know, appeal to guys our age. She... She says she likes them young, and I guess... I don't know, man. They're fucked up, and we gotta tell someone. <laughs> <laughs> like who, Matt? The, the police? Yeah. Yeah. A cokehead and a dealer walk into the police station with this fucking story, sure. Well, then what? I don't know. You don't know? No. Well, think of something fast. That other guy... We gotta save him. You wanna go back? We have to. We do not have to. Matt gets out of the car. I know where I am. I can make it anywhere in this town on foot. Fine, Matt. Whatever. Jordan drives off. And we fade out. The end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeff. <laughs> One more hand for the couple upstairs. <laughs> um, we will be back. Uh, we have. <laughs> Uh, we have one more little break, but word for our sponsors, and then we have one more <laughs> presentation for you. Sure do. <laughs> we'll catch you off in a minute. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm Magnolia Zuniga. I'm a clinical Ayurvedic specialist practicing in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Ayurveda is a system of traditional medicine and practices to prevent and treat illness by maintaining balance in the body, mind, and consciousness. I work with clients in person and online to create individualized health plans that blend dietary and lifestyle protocols, Ayurvedic therapies, prescribed yoga, and breathing practices to encourage holistic health and well-being. I also formulate organic, botanical, and pharmaceutical-grade herbal remedies. I create a safe environment for clients to grow and empower themselves to implement and maintain healthy and satisfying lifestyles. Call today to set up your first appointment. At Afrolytics, we focus on holistic health and wellness. Based in Albuquerque, we offer yoga classes with a monthly subscription option, as well as private sessions for deeper work. Beyond these one-on-one -on -one sessions, Afrolytics Yoga provides connections to life coaches who share and impart their experiential wisdom. Cultivating even further, we host space for training Capoeira Angola, the roots. Our tutoring services offers education support in science, technology, and engineering, including study skills and organizational habits, with the goal of helping our students to become independent, lifelong learners. Afrolytics offers live sound, engineering, and performances at local food markets, galas, and art shows. To catch a vibe, contact us for more information. I think the most important part of the Money Learning Lab is the real world impact that we have on people. To see them just hearing the word finance and feeling nervous about it and being able to go to a place where they start to understand. People are so grateful for that and it makes me sad because it's not something that you should be thankful for because you haven't had access to it before. It should be normal to understand finances. It should be normal to have this kind of education in your language, in your culture. There are tangible ways that people actually improve their lives and we get to be a part of that. And we are back, folks. Uh, we have one more set for you that is sure to keep you coming back for more. It's true. Next up, we have Joseph Levy, uh, a young gun talent here in New Mexico, uh, with his piece, Dust. Uh, just a little bit about Joseph. Uh, so Joseph is a writer and performer born and raised in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He is currently pursuing his BFA in film and digital media at the University of New Mexico and hopes to pursue an MFA in dramatic writing at UNM. Mm. So speak of the little devil, let's bring him on up here. <laughs> Hello, thank you for having me. Um, so Dust is a story about a family and probably several families that struggled to make it through the brutality of the Dust Bowl. 
It's that mixed with a little bit of Americano gothic horror stuff and bad dreams and Bob Dylan. So thank you. <laughs> Dust by Joseph Levy. Fade from black. Exterior Oklahoma day. The land seems to never end. It just keeps going. Small farmhouses decorate the long flat area. There are fields that fill in the gaps, but they are shells of their former selves. The land is long past arid. Children bear dust-covered faces and hungry bellies. A large dust cloud forms behind them. The children peek their heads from the field and sprint back to their small farmhouses. Mothers wait on doorsteps for their children to scurry in. They look 40, but are probably 30. That's how it goes in the land of the dust. Cut to exterior general store day. The long wooden building is as beaten and old and the, land that it, and the land that it sits on. Windows covered with blankets and boards. Bare two by fours mark the steps up. It's run down. You sure you ain't have nothing? Nothing, Abe. Like I told you last week, Roosevelt is supposed to send an aid, but we ain't got canned goods in a month. Nothing. I ain't bullshitting you, Abe. They're not delivering in this shit. All right, then. A man exits the store, Abel, 36. A local farmer with a family and a farm on the hill. His overalls are worn in past the point of comfortable. He looks tired. He dusts the debris off his cap and places it over his dirty, sweaty mug. He enters the 32 Ford truck parked in the dirt lot in front of the store. The old mobile, a mobile kicks up dust when he turns the key. Pause. Shit. He turns the key again. Dust kicks up again, but this time it turns over. The truck pulls out of the lot and onto the road home. He goes back empty-handed. Cut to interior Abel's truck day. Abel's truck trudges down the long dirt road separating the vast plains of Oklahoma. His eyes seem fixated on the road ahead of him, though occasionally in his peripheral he'd catch cars attempting their way west to California. They had wagons filled with entire lives hitched to the back of them. Cars whose engines were filled with what was, what, what just filled everything here, dust. Abel sees children walking with lanterns or long sticks held out in front of them, helping them through the sharp black fog. He thinks about his family and his farm while doing so. The truck finally turns onto an off-road and up to a small house that sits behind long fields that long that once held a harvest now are packed high with piles of sand. Abel pulls up to the house and parks in front of the house. His wife, Mary, 32, leans on the wooden fence lining the front of the porch, waiting for his return. She's equally tired looking, though the dust has not aged her like it has Abel. There is still some grace left in her. Abel exits the truck and takes off his hat in the, in the presence of Mary. Exterior, front yard, afternoon. Afternoon. They have anything? No. They said nothing's getting delivered in this. What you reckon we fix for supper then? We got some canned corn. I checked this morning. Out of potatoes and we ain't growing any in this. He rubs the dirt and sweat from his thinking brow. I'll go clean up and fetch that corn. Call the girls in and tell them supper. All right. Abel makes his way up the front steps and into the house. Cut to interior farmhouse moments later. The house has dust-covered tile lining its floors, wallpaper peeling from the edges. The old wooden kitchen table bears a tattered cloth draped over the top with glasses and plates turned upside down. A 12-gauge shotgun is brandished on the mantel. Interior, back room, afternoon. Abel makes his way into the back bedroom, which has two cots and a small dresser, a shattered mirror resting on top. In one of the cots, an elderly man seemingly asleep. This is Mary's father, just known as Grandpa, 72. Abel pushes him to make sure he's alive. He snores. Abel places his hat on the dresser and kneels at the side of the bed. Cut to exterior farm field, dusk. It is silent. All that is heard is Abel's voice. Mary calls in the two young girls playing in the field. There's Diaphany, 11, and Louise, 8. 
sisters and the daughters of Abel and Mary. They run to Mary and grab one hand each. They turn to walk toward the house. Behind them is a dust cloud. It spans from the earth below to the heavens above and swallows the backdrop in behind them. God, I have welcomed you into my home many times in prayer. It would be dishonest to say that my faith has not been shaken with what's going on here. I asked for a bountiful harvest last spring, which you gave me, and, and I'm thankful for it. Though I feel that these oats I sowed in spring have come back to haunt me. My fields are dry and I cannot produce what is required to service my family. Interior, farmhouse, night. The family gathers around the dinner table. Each has a small pour of milk in their glasses and a little bit of corn on their plates. Shall we say grace? The family hold their heads down while Abel says grace. Um, uh, thank you, Lord, for this meal we have before us. It's not much. Mary raises her eyes at Abel. She gives him a concerned gaze, and he returns it to her. But we are modest members of your flock, and, and we ask that you continue to watch over us. Amen. They all say amen in unison. They eat their meal in silence. Their candle-lit lantern flickers above them, swaying back and forth. Dust can be seen floating through the rays of light. Cut to interior farmhouse. An hour later, Mary puts the girls down for bed, then joins Abel in the back room. Abel is lying in bed. He's dissecting the Bible with a pen when she enters. He looks up from it and gives her room to lie down. She does. Mary sparks up a conversation while resting her lips on Abel's shoulder. Have you thought of going west? West? West to California. He takes off his spectacles and places his book on the bedside table, sitting, sitting himself up. What you want in California? Away from this. I've seen people on roads thinking the same thing you is. There ain't nothing in California made for us. Like there is here? What's here, Abe? There ain't nothing but dust. You don't think I don't know it? I've heard the tale of, of California and what, and what they think of folks like us, like dogs or, or vermin. Cockroaches scurrying from a flame. Abel tries to calm himself down. Anyone who made it up to California and had and, and such found nothing but prejudice. There ain't no work there. I just heard talk on the radio that, that it's going to get worse, Abe. Daphne just got over her pneumonia and Louise ain't as strong. I, I, I'm scared, Abe. Abel kisses Mary on the forehead. He understands her fears. He's afraid himself. I know. We'll talk about this in the morning. Mary nods her head and places it down on the pillow. Abel looks at her as a tear rolls down his nose. He wipes it, looking over to Grandpa in his cot. Grandpa's eyes are fully open, gawking at Abel. He blows the lantern out harshly. Cut to interior back room day. Mary wakes up alone in her cot. She looks at her to his side. Grandpa has left his cot. This is unusual. She got, gets herself up. Everything feels odd. Interior farmhouse day. Mary emerges from the back room. She wraps herself in her nightgown. The girls are still sound asleep in their cots. She peers out the front door. Grandpa is nailing tarp to the front window of the house. Looking out, she sees Abel just standing upfield, standing in front of the biggest black blizzard she had ever seen. It is all moving so quickly toward them. Abel! Abel! Bible in hand, he opens in his arms and embraces what's coming. He's quickly swallowed by the dust. Mary screams a long, painful shriek. Cut to interior back room day. It's just a dream. Mary turns beside her grandpa, still laying in his cot, sound asleep. Again, she gets out of bed, this time for real, leaving the back room. Fade to black, the end. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. That wraps up our show. Um, let's give a round of applause for all the amazing actors and our writers for this evening. Actors, if you want to go ahead and join me up here. And once again, we want to thank tonight's uh, sponsors. This would not have been possible without your generosity. Our, our good friends at Triple Tone Audio Post and West, the place to start and grow your business. I'm Stephanie Grillo. I'm Tiffany Cole. And this has been Coming, Coming in Hot. <laughs>
Dr. Stogsdill and I have a passion for science and art. Dentistry allows us to merge those two worlds. Maven Dentistry is a local, family-owned dental office that provides preventative, restorative, and cosmetic dentistry with personalized care for each patient. We prioritize comfort and satisfaction as we take the time to explain complex procedures and collaborate on individual treatment plans. We make it simple for you to take control of your oral health. At Maven Dentistry, we are more than just a dental practice. We are a family. Visit us and experience the Maven difference. Sew Together is a boutique-style quilt shop specializing in modern, fun, and colorful fabrics that spark excitement and creativity for all projects. All of our fabrics are chosen for their high-quality cotton weave to provide you with only the best in today's market. We feature a large selection of art gallery fabrics desired for their beautifully designed patterns and silky feel to be sewn into custom quilts or unique garments. We stock cotton and bamboo batting, quilting supplies and notions, and offer long arm quilting as well as a variety of classes led by highly qualified and creative instructors. Visit us today! I approached Wes because I had a passion project that I didn't really understand how to start from the ground up, and they gave me the tools to do that. They're a solid organization that helps you start your business when you need information and the know-how. They've been very helpful as far as giving me advice and feedback to give me the stepping stones that was necessary for growth. Looking for capital, it kind of felt discouraging, so I went to Wes and they came to me with the Hope Fund. When I heard about the Hope Fund, it gave me hope that I could actually make things work for the short term and for the long term. With the capital from the Hope Fund, I was able to purchase equipment, software, tools that media companies need to be able to produce high quality content. By taking advantage of this and working with Wes, I didn't only grow my business, but I grew personally as a business owner. Working with Wes, it made me feel comfortable and it made me have a sense of security, knowing that I had a team behind me to help me succeed and I wasn't out there on my own.